So we need to discuss what you guys would like to see in the rest of the semester and also uh, in the second semester. Um, I think the next topic should be path integrals. We want to get that done. Path integrals for boson fields and fermion fields. Um, then there are a wide variety of topics. I, are we starting? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, there's a wide variety of topics. Uh, one is, of course, renormalization. Another is using path integral methods to um, justify, for example, more rigorously the formula we've been using for the fermion, for the boson, for the photon propagator. And um, another topic is Yang Mills uh, theory that is to say not really engaged in uh, the standard model. Um, then um, other possible topics are grand unification, supersymmetry, um, Dense matter that are, we could go into uh, around the renormalization group a little bit and some of its applications. Um, so there's also supergravity and strings. Um, um, so these are a lot of topics. Um, Anyway, so the, 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 the idea is think about those and say, could you send me some email or tell me now what you think? Renormalization stuff. Renormalization would be good. I mean, obviously there's a lot of topics, but um, a, a good overview with this semester and maybe some more in depth stuff. You mean next semester? Uh, well, if we start this semester, maybe a little bit next semester as well. Yeah. Um, non really engaged theories would be fun. Yeah, I think that's absolutely essential because, um, uh, first of all, it's the essence of it is very simple and very important. Um, All right, well, let me, today we're just going to do Compton scattering. Um, so let me, let me get on with that, and um, we can then uh, see what happens if I manage to finish this. If I manage to finish this before um, the end of the hour. So the Feynman diagram, there are two. One is, so PK, P prime, K prime, and then the other one. The other one has the same fermion structure, but instead what you have is you have K prime and K coming in like that. So those are the two diagrams, and before, because the fermion structure is essentially the same, there isn't any minus sign. So we can just use uh, the Feynman rules to set this thing up. So you've got a U bar of P prime and S prime at this end, then you've got a vertex, which is uh, minus i e gamma mu, and then you've got a photon, I'm doing this one, a photon coming out, and so you have an epsilon star mu of uh, k prime and t prime, 
T prime being the label for the one for two photon polarizations. Then you have a, a fermion propagator, and clearly the momentum on this line is P plus K. Momentum on this line is P minus K prime. And so this one has um, I P slash plus K slash plus M divided by P plus K squared minus M squared. And then we've got this vertex here, which of course we don't want to use mu again. Back down. I can use Greek letters, but what the hell? Uh, e nu of k and t, and then finally you big brown again. You're doing the, the first. Is there a question? You're doing the first or the second diagram? I'm doing the first diagram, I hope. But the the you've got the photon propagator has a has a star for the polarization vector. Yeah, but isn't shouldn't that shouldn't that correspond to the first vertex? So it no, 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 no. What uh, happens, the funny thing, if you're writing from left to right, uh -huh. then with fermions, you start at the back end. Okay. Okay. Now, if, I guess if you were writing in Hebrew or some other Semitic language, then this might be more natural. We'd start writing from right to left. And, um, but, so, but still, everything on one side of the propagator should correspond to one vertex, and everything on the other should correspond to the other vertex. Right. So the the photon polarization vector is in, for uh, epsilon sub mu is an incoming photon, right? No, it's an outgoing. It's K prime. It's, it's, it's K prime. prime it's K prime, prime and T prime. Outgoing. The star means it's outgoing. Okay. No star. No, so the, okay, both of them are primes. All right. I'm sorry. I'm happy. <laughs> Good. Okay. The next one, and if we just look at it here, would be U bar P prime and S prime. Now we have a vertex, and it turns out that it's nicer to write it to, to switch from U and nu, so as to make this a little more symmetrical. So um, minus I E gamma nu, well here gamma up a nu E nu of um, K and T. So that's this vertex. And then the propagator is I P slash minus K prime slash plus M over P minus K prime squared minus M squared. And then here we have this vertex. And I'm going to use the same mu there. So it's minus I V e gamma mu. E mu star, K prime, T prime, and then uh, finally the incoming U of P and S. All right, so um, this is what you have for I M equals this plus that. And obviously you can factor a lot. Um, what you can do is you can say that this is minus i e squared e mu star of k prime and t prime. In fact, I don't know why I started using epsilons. It probably makes more sense to use e's. By the way, there was a question, and I forgot to give out the candy, so. Here's a Snickers. So you said for the first diagram, you basically write from right to left, and just write, basically just write from, start right from the diagram, and go to the left. 
Yeah, right basically down. with fermion lines, you just start from here and go down, and then you go across left to right in script. And for the second time? From the end to the beginning on the fermion line. All right, so it depends on the fermion line. Mm. All right. And I think with anti-fermions, it's, it's the opposite way. Uh -huh. It's a more natural way, but you have to do that in the diagram when you see it. All right. Um, now, there are a number of tricks. Uh, this is E nu of k and t, and we have the u bar of p prime, s prime, and now a bracket, and then we have gamma mu, p slash plus k slash, whoop, plus m, I see it's just that my writing is so bad, uh, p plus k squared minus m squared plus gamma nu, p slash minus k prime uh, slash plus m gamma mu over p minus k prime squared minus m squared u p and s. Okay, now, oops, I left something out. Duh. Okay. Now there are various simplifications that occur. For example, P plus K squared minus M squared. Well, P squared is M squared, which cancels the M squared. K squared is zero. So this is just 2P dot K. And P minus K prime squared, similarly, is just minus 2P dot K prime. So there's a lot of simplification that occurs almost uh, immediately. So these things we're going to replace by 2p dot k, and this one by minus 2p dot k. Okay, but now things happen in the numerator, and um, well, one of the things is, remember Dirac's equation is i d slash minus m psi equals 0. And um, so when the i d slash hits the u, you, um, what you have is i d slash on uh, u e to the minus i p x. And this gives us simply um, uh, p slash on u e to the minus i px. And so um, what we have then is p, this equation is p slash minus m on u is equal to 0. Um, and when it hits the other one, the v, it's i d slash on v e to the i p x, and so that would be um, uh, minus p slash v, and so the rule is p slash plus m on v is equal to zero. We don't need that now, but in a later computation you might. Any Okay, well, um, we can use this Dirac equation of momentum space, play space, mainly p slash minus n u of p and s equals zero, because we have then p slash plus m gamma nu, say, this thing, u of p and s. Well, what we do is we just write this out explicitly, so it's gamma mu, gamma nu, P mu plus m gamma nu u. And now gamma mu gamma nu, of course, the basic thing about gamma matrices that's a 
you knew. And I, I, once again, I apologize for all these stupid Greek letters. It's dumb. It, it, I actually studied Greek for three years in high school. I was captured by my high school forced to do these things. And, um, uh, but, you know, even with three years of Greek, it still confuses me to write Greek letters. Anyway, what we have here then is 2 eta mu nu minus gamma nu gamma mu p mu plus m gamma nu u. Okay, so what this gives us then is 2 p nu Um, let me just check my notes to make sure I haven't gone off the word reservation. P nu, and then what we have is minus gamma nu times P slash minus M, and all that on U. Well, P slash minus M on U is zero, and so this is just two P nu U. By the way, you know, a lot of uh, these books make a lot of, um, make a big deal out of working out all these gamma matrices, you know. The fact is that with computers, um, you really don't need to use all these clever tricks. You can just take the thing in all its complexity and um, write a computer program and just have it do it. Um, after all, Matrix multiplication is a simple instruction called MATMOL in Fortran 90. And um, there's also something, it's an equivalent thing for trace. And um, presumably, in, uh, well, certainly there are libraries for C and C, etc. So you really, there's no reason to become, I, I, I don't think there's any reason to. I'm an expert on gamma technology. Um, I, I, I actually heard a story uh, once about T.D. Lee that somebody asked him what he was doing one afternoon, and he said he was saying he was practicing this gamma technology, <laughs> this agility with gamma matrices. And of course, that was back probably in the 50s or 60s when the war had any computers to speak of. I mean, the war computers were the size of this room, and they cost millions of dollars. And um, so you, you, you know, didn't, so there, so it was, you, it made sense to be a gamma to practice these things, but th these days it's, it's, uh, in fact, far more reliable to write a good computer program than to screw around and try to be super clever. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll give you the conventional viewpoint now. So what happens is, basically, you see the same, uh, this thing has simplified enormously. P slash plus M gamma nu has turned into just two P nu gamma nu. Um, a similar thing happens over here. P slash plus M gamma mu turns into just two P mu uh, times u. And at, at that point, then, what we have is I m is equal to minus I e squared uh, e mu star prime. I'm going to abbreviate things a little bit. E nu u bar prime. And then what will be here is a gamma mu, a k slash, a gamma nu plus 2 gamma mu p nu. And remember, the denominator is just 2 p dot k. And I'm using dot even though it's a four, it's a low end in a product. And of course, we've got, who is this metric? Um, now, what we've got is we've got a minus sign down here. On the other hand, this is the term that survives, and it has a minus sign. So altogether, what we have here is plus um, well, I've gone a little faster than I should have. 
Kevin here. Yeah. Okay, this is Gamma Nu K prime slash Gamma Mu um, minus two Gamma Nu K Mu over two P dot K prime. Times U of P. Okay. Well, at this point, um, one might as well bring in the epsilons. This is not what Peskin and Schroeder do, but it is what Weinberg does, and I think Weinberg's approach is much better. So um, the next step is to just contract epsilon nu with gamma nu, and that's epsilon slash. So we have minus i e squared u bar prime. And what we have then is epsilon star slash k slash epsilon slash plus 2 epsilon star slash p dot epsilon. So oh, that's a break at least. Um, we might as well pull out 2. So this is dot k plus epsilon slash k prime slash epsilon star slash minus 2 epsilon slash p dot epsilon star over p dot k prime and then u. And notice here epsilon star slash is epsilon star u gamma mu, or since we like to kind of keep the gammas up, so it's, it's that. It's not, it's not the same thing as epsilon mu gamma mu star. So the star is on the epsilon, not on the gamma. Okay. Any questions? Nobody's hungry? Okay, well now um, we have to take the absolute value of this thing. And so to do that, what we want is, what we have is u bar prime, a bracket, and a u. And we want to take the complex conjugate of this thing. Well, the complex conjugate of this thing is the complex conjugate of u prime dagger gamma zero bracket u. And this is, of course, it's just u dagger uh, bracket dagger gamma zero dagger u Okay, but remember, gamma zero squared is one because gamma zero zero is one in Peskin uh, Schroeder land. So we can stick in a gamma zero squared, so we get u dagger gamma zero gamma zero, and of course gamma zero is Hermitian. So this is what we actually have. Okay, now, and so this act, let me just slow this down and go one more step. Gamma zero, bracket, dagger, gamma zero, u prime. Because you dagger, gamma zero is u prime. Okay, well, we saw that if we had a single gamma matrix here, this thing just, disappeared and gave us the gamma matrix. The reason is that gamma zero dagger is gamma zero, and gamma i dagger is minus gamma i. So the gamma, the, the spatial gammas are anti-hermitian, the time gamma is hermitian. On the other hand, the spatial gammas anti-commute with gamma zero but the um, uh, time one commutes with gamma zero. So we've got a minus sign on the spatial ones, they anti-commute with gamma zero. 
So let's just look at what this thing is. Let's just go one more step. It's u bar gamma zero. And what we're going to have is we're going to have various gammas in here, but we can imagine that this thing is just gamma A, gamma B, down to gamma Z. You can have any number of these things. Gamma zero U prime, and there's a dagger here. Well, when we dagger that, what, we, what this gives us is gamma zero, and now we have gamma Z dagger, gamma Y dagger, dot, 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 gamma B dagger, gamma A dagger, gamma zero U prime. But now, if we bring the gamma zero through, every time there's a spatial one, we get two minus signs. When there's a time one, we get no minus signs. So we go, as we come through here, we just strip off all the daggers. And then the last gamma zero hits here and disappears. So the answer is. So that applies whether what's in the bracket is a multiplicative combination or an additive combination? Because if thinking kind of more generally over Well, I'm, I'm just doing monomials now. Okay. But would it apply? If it, well, if it's a polynomial, then you have to complex conjugate the coefficients. But that's all. Right. And so the basic thing is, the basic rule then is u bar prime gammas U complex conjugate equals U bar re reverse gamma. So I might do it like this. Okay, so this is reversed gammas. In other words, U bar prime gamma A to gamma C, U, complex conjugate, equals U bar, gamma Z, gamma A, U prime. Right, okay. So that's the rule. Again, though, this is gamma technology that's really, as I said, it's it, it, in the world of computers, If you think this is too hard, then just blow it away and write a computer program. And it'll be fine. Okay. So now we get something complicated. In other words, we're forming m squared, and so what do we have? We have e to the fourth over four. And now we have u bar prime alpha bracket alpha beta. By bracket, I mean, you know, all this stuff. U beta. And then, the effect of this, with everything backwards. And backwards and complex conjugated. And so, maybe I should, maybe I should actually well, I'll write it out explicitly. It's u bar a, and then it's going to be epsilon star slash a slash epsilon prime slash plus two epsilon prime slash p dot epsilon star over p dot k plus epsilon prime slash k prime slash epsilon slash star minus two epsilon slash star p dot epsilon prime over p dot k prime a b u prime b. So that's what we've got. Notice here the first term was Let's see. I may have gotten this slightly wrong here. This is epsilon, this is surely. Yeah, I was mistaken in the notes here. 
this epsilon is clearly that one. So this is epsilon prime star. This is epsilon prime star. This is epsilon prime star. That's epsilon prime star. That's that. And that's why when we complex conjugate it, the epsilon primes don't have any star, but the epsilons have no stars. So sorry about that. Okay. Um, all right. Well, you can see this is really a mess, and I would say any sensible what person. What are the K stars? I'm sorry. The K, K stars. K. Well, K is real. K is a real orbit, so you don't need to start with K. But it's worth a candy. Anybody else on the right here? I hope you guys brush your teeth and um, don't get diabetes. But, um, I guess it's only two lectures a week, so you're probably safe. Okay, well, now what we're going to do is we're going to average over the initial spins of the electron and sum over the final spins of the electron. And so that means. We do one half sum s s prime of m squared, and that's going to be e to the fourth over eight. And now what's going to happen is this is going to turn into um, p slash plus m beta a, and um, if we leave the alpha here and bring this is just a number. So we can bring this over to the other side, and it's e bar alpha prime. And of course, we're summing over everything. So we're summing over alpha, beta, and a and b. Um, and this turns into p slash plus m. This one turns into p prime slash plus m. And now you see this thing goes alpha, beta, beta, A, A, B, B, alpha. So this is the B alpha matrix element of this. Okay. So this is just a big trace. So this is the trace of uh, epsilon prime star slash K slash epsilon slash plus 2 epsilon prime slash star p dot epsilon over p dot k. This is from this part. And then plus epsilon slash k prime slash epsilon prime star slash minus 2 epsilon slash p dot epsilon prime star over p dot k prime. And then we have p slash plus m. And then we have epsilon star slash. So this is just an epsilon star slash. k slash epsilon prime slash plus 2 epsilon prime slash p dot epsilon star. Was there a question? Uh, I just uh, I don't follow this. Even if k is real. Uh, isn't there a sign change because of the, so gamma i dagger is minus gamma i, right? So gamma i star should be related to the transpose with the minus sign? Well, but we brought through the gamma zero. See, I mean, I proved, I proved this thing in general, that u bar prime, gamma a, dot, 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 gamma z, u star is u bar, the gamma is reversed, gamma z dot 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 gamma a u prime. So all you do is reverse the order of everything and complex conjugate the things that are complex. And this star always means that it's the epsilon that gets starred, not the gamma. That's 
epsilon prime slash p prime slash epsilon star slash minus two epsilon star slash p dot epsilon prime over p dot k prime p prime slash plus m. Okay, so that's the trace. Okay, now in this, as I said, modern world of computers, you can just write a computer program to do this whole trace, and it is no big deal, right? especially if you're using a high-level language like Fortran 90. Um, okay. And of course, this is trace, not h bar. Okay, well, some of these traces involve eight gamma matrices. Some of them involve seven gamma matrices, and they are... What's the trace of seven gammas? Seven gammas in a row. Yes. What's the trace of one gamma? Trace two. 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 The trace of one gamma is? Is it two or no? Is it it's not two. Seven ones two. Down the, the only diagonal is one, right? right? Let's look at the gamma matrix. I thought that the only gamma zero has one down the diagonal. Am I wrong? Well, there's one point gamma zero. Well, oh, that's gamma zero. <laughs> <laughs> So it's zero. You <laughs> 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 All right. So, what's the trace of one gamma? <laughs> zero. Zero. You get a candy. Look at it. It's not the choice. All right. So the trace of one gamma is zero. And I think I proved last time that the trace of an odd number of gamma is zero. In any case, one can prove it um, by, well, let's see. I don't know how to prove it, actually, in the right off thing. But anyway, you can prove it without any. Anyway, we proved it last time. Let me not try to think about a proof for it. It's, it's, it's um, the trace of an odd number of gamma matrices is zero. But as I said, you, you then have to deal with the trace of eight gammas, the trace of six gammas, the trace of uh, four gammas, the trace of two gammas. And um, it's a real mess. And I would say, if you were, you know, if you wanted to do this, you could just, as I said, write a computer program for it. Um, of course, the problem is you'd want something that was symbolic rather than numerical. And um, that's a little more tricky. Um, there was a marvelous project started at MIT um, that developed a symbolic manipulation program called Maxima. And unfortunately, it was done in commercially by uh, Wolfram's um, Mathematica um, and then by and then Maple, and, which is too bad because it was a better symbol manipulator than either one of them. Uh, and now I think it's pulling in. Huh? Not anymore. It was better. Now it's not so great compared to this. at least less than my training. It's still it's well. Still it's it, it it wasn't. Good. All right. I don't know how good. I haven't tried Mathematica for symbol manipulation lately. Um, it. I'd be delighted to hear that it was pretty good. But what I found when I. My last use of a symbol manipulation was a long time ago. Um, I found it could easily do the things I could do, 
but the things that I needed to do for research, it just died. That is still true. Huh? <laughs> it's what? That is still true. Still true. Yeah. yeah. See, the point is that the serious symbol manipulation is, is, is done by some scientists, but not by most people. And so, commercial value is small. It's too bad. Anyway, um, sorry for all these tangents. I better get moving so we get this thing done. Now, um, I'm not going to do all these traces. I'll do one of the eight component traces for you. Um, uh, and in order to do that, I'm going to go to Coulomb's gauge. And the lab frame. Because this is photon off electron. And so in the electron, Jesus Christ. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, some of the time, you call me back. Um, I don't know who that is. I imagine <laughs> a robo wall. So this is so this is the lab. We're doing Compton scattering. We're in the lab frame. So the initial, the incoming electron is just at rest m zero, and that means that some of these terms here are very simple. P dot epsilon, remember, in the Coulomb, in, in Coulomb's gauge, there were really only two epsilons, and they are x hat plus or minus i y hat divided by the square root of 2. So the epsilons are very simple. They only have spatial components. So P dot epsilon is also equal to P dot epsilon prime, and they're equal zero, um, and so all of these terms are gone. This is gone. Uh, that, that one is also gone, and um, that one's gone, and uh, that one's gone. So what we've got is, is, is simpler, and so let me get rid of these things that are gone. Okay, so these guys are all gone, and that means uh, what we have left is um, traces of eight, traces of six, and um, I think that's about it. Right. Okay. So let's look at one, I'll do one of these traces, um, namely something Weinberg calls T1. And um, so T1 is going to be the trace of P prime slash, epsilon prime slash, K slash, epsilon slash, P slash, epsilon slash, k slash, epsilon prime slash. Okay, so in other words, it's... Oh, also, um, Weinberg decided to make things easy and use real epsilons, which is uh, fine, you can use real epsilons. And um, so in other words, we'll basically room? use x hat and y hat. Do you have to be in the Coulomb gauge? For and of course, when I say these are the epsilons, these are the epsilons uh, for a photon in the z direction. For the other photons, uh, you just you do a rotation matrix on them. Was there a, quite, there was a question? Is, what was the the fact that you can set the polarization, make the polarization vector real, is that, is that a byproduct of the gauge that you choose? Um, I, I don't think so. I think that that's just generally true. Isn't, isn't it the... Is it the Here, well, I catch this at the moment. Yeah. I'm trying to remember from me and it was like the, the iconal equation where you can make the polarization vector real, but it was only true sometimes. 
Isn't it just a vector? Like, you, like why is it trouble when I get two D vector? But, well, it was if, if you had certain. No, maybe it was only at the free. All right, let, let's see. I don't want to get down into the weeds too far here. Let me just say I think we're fine with real epsilons. Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, okay, so that's why this is what we've got. Also, for some reason, Weinberg took this p prime. It's a trace. You can take this p prime and put it all the way to the front here if you want. Probably he did that because he kept this there. Anyway, it's it's it's. P prime slash epsilon prime slash k slash epsilon slash times P slash epsilon slash k slash epsilon prime slash uh, uh, and that's what we've got. Okay. So that's one of the terms. There are many, there are several other terms. There are three eight gamma terms and I'm sorry, there are four eight gamma terms and four six gamma terms. Um, okay, so now in here we've got something that simplifies a lot. Epsilon slash P slash Epsilon slash. And first of all, remember over here when we had we had a gamma mu and we could move it through a P slash and what we got was a minus sign and then a two gamma nu. And this two gamma nu, a two P nu is effectively the dot product of uh, well let me let me let me prove it to you in general let's just do this thing correctly um, this uh, this is epsilon a gamma a epsilon b gamma b and then epsilon slash okay well gamma a gamma b is um, 2 gamma b gamma a minus eta a b times epsilon a epsilon b epsilon slash. Wait, where did where, where the p go? Oh, this is p b. That's p slash. And so this is p b. Okay, so this thing is now 2 p slash epsilon slash squared minus, and the a to a b here is just, just gives us a minus epsilon dot p epsilon slash. Well, epsilon dot p is zero. So that means then that, let me do this up here. Epsilon slash p slash epsilon slash then is um, that one zero? So this is two p slash epsilon slash squared. On the other hand, epsilon slash squared is this is two p slash epsilon a epsilon b gamma a gamma b. But this is one half the anti-commutator. So that's a to a b, and so this is two p slash epsilon a epsilon b a to a b, and that then is two p slash epsilon dot epsilon, and um, in Peston Schroeder land, that's minus one, and so this is minus two p slash. Wait a minute, there shouldn't be a 2 there. Right, there's no 2 there. Gamma A, gamma B is that minus this. Um, now, is there a 2 here? Hold on, let me just get this right. There's a 2 here. But it's 2 times 0. So let me just fix this. I should follow my notes, of course, and then get this. 
wait a minute, it's a minus sign that I left down. Right, there's a minus sign here, God. And um, so that minus sign I've got, and this is a plus sign, right? Boy, I've really, I'm sorry about screwing this up so much. So you get this structure here. Um, 
this one is um, minus one, so that makes this plus, and um, all together <coughs> T1 is equal to A P dot K times two P prime dot epsilon prime K dot epsilon prime plus P prime dot K. K is there, and these two guys are obviously the same. Um, now one can perform a few more manipulations here. Ep epsilon prime dot P prime is epsilon prime dot P plus K minus K prime. This is for momentum conservation. And um, Epsilon prime dot P is zero. Epsilon prime dot K prime is zero because we're in Coulomb's gauge. And so this is equal to epsilon prime dot K. And one can also show that K dot P prime is minus a half. P prime minus K squared plus a half M squared. And um, then formal momentum conservation gives you minus a half P minus K prime squared. I've got minus a half M squared. I can't imagine that's right. That's more than half M squared. And this is then um, K prime dot P. So you can shift over to prime if you want. Why? So when you said epsilon prime dot K prime is zero, why does the gauge matter? Epsilon is just the polarization. Right. So, because isn't the in Coulomb gauge K? Well, there are two things going on here. We're in Coulomb's gauge, uh -huh. and we've also we're also using these polarization vectors that um, are purely spatial. Okay, that helps. Yeah, that's spatial. Okay. And um, so this is this is this. In as much as this is purely spatial, then this is the dot product is just the statement that momentum and the polarization yeah. vector are perpendicular. Yeah. Let me get you a candy. And why why does the gauge come into that though? Isn't that isn't that not always? All right, all right, you've got two candies. Two candies. <coughs> oh, me that. Okay, what was the second question? Why is why is the gauge important when we say that? What happens in I thought, isn't it, because we, we decompose the thing into plane waves, right? Is it what? Plane waves. So well, yeah, yeah, everything. I mean, everything. We're, we're, we're talking about, uh, we're doing perturbation theory, so all of the initial and final states are eigenstates of the free Hamiltonian, so they're just part of the moving constant. Yeah. So um, isn't, isn't the fact that the, the polarization, I mean, isn't, isn't it always perpendicular? Or, but the, in Coulomb's gauge. In Coulomb's gauge. Does that have to do with the time component that we're that you said? We're it's going? partly the time component, but it's partly that we have just said that Coulomb's gauge is defined by the divergence of the three vector part um, is zero. Oh, um, that's what we know. So we accomplish that by saying that k dot epsilon of um, K and whatever the index always is zero. So that's a Coulomb gauge condition. Oh, okay. Perfect. And we're in Coulomb. All right. Let me now, just as an aside, just do something that Peskin and Schroeder, because Peskin lives on the West Coast, he put this in. Um, no, it's true. Mandelstam, you see, was a professor, or is a professor at Berkeley. And um, he introduced some cute variables called Mandelstam variables. And uh, I'll just tell you something about them now, even though I'm not actually going to use them. But I, I just think, as an aside, so let's have a process. Suppose we have a process here where you have P. Maybe I should do it this way. P1, P2, P3. If I do it this way, it will be more symmetric. So in a real process, of course, P3 
is minus the physical momentum. If, if these are the incoming ones, and P3 and P4 are minus, right? an overall minus sign. In any event, S is P1 plus P2 squared. T is P1 plus P3 squared. And U is P1 plus P4 squared. So he introduced these three variables, Mandelstam did. And the remarkable thing is that ST is the stu, S plus T plus U is equal to the sum I equals 1 to 4 of m sub i squared. Okay. It's in uh, it's in the discussion that precedes Compton scattering in um, uh, uh, test controller. Um, this works when uh, two things are true. The p's are all on the mass shell. Okay. P0 squared is p vector squared for each of them. I'm sorry, p vector squared plus m squared for each of them. And secondly, energy momentum is conserved. So for a Feynman diagram, if those are the legs, aren't they always on the mass shell? Yes. Oh. That's why it's useful. OK. So that, this was just an aside. You can read about it in the Heston Schroeder. It's worth playing with and deriving. All right. Now, um, however, I've just worked out what, uh, what T1 is. And we've got these various expressions for it. In fact, the, the expression, the final expression that uh, Weinberg uses is that T1 is equal to 16 P dot K epsilon prime dot k squared plus a p dot k p dot k prime. So that's our uh, final expression for T1. And then, of course, you know, if I were masochistic and sadistic, I'd go through the other seven, but we're going to skip them. And as I said, in the modern world of computers, we can just do them. Um, the flux, now we're in the lab frame, so the flux Again, it's v over v, but v now is 1 over v. is 1, little velocity is 1, and v is that. Um, let me just see how much time I've got left. You want me to go through the final states in detail? I mean, how we do the, the v's and the t's and the, and the final states, how we go from m squared to the differential cross-section. Um, I've done that a couple of times. In, I've done that at least once in class. I don't know if you want to see it again or not. So let's quickly vote. Because who wants to see it? Is it significantly different than last time? Doesn't make any difference. But all right, we've got. All right, if you want to see it, I'll do it. <laughs> okay. One half the sum s s prime of s squared. Is what? Well, this is going to be 2 pi to the fourth overall momentum delta function. And then the square of this is just dt. And then we have 1 half sum n squared. Okay. So that's what we're dealing with. To make this a probability, we have to divide. We divide this by the uh, two EVs because of the normalization, the pest and Schroeder normalization. Um, to make it a rate, we divide by T, so now we've got a rate. Uh, to make it sort of a cross-section, uh, what we do to get a D sigma is what we do is we take the rate and uh, divide by the flux. And so it's the rate over the flux, but then summed over final states. And so we have V dQ P prime, V dQ K prime 
over, in both cases, 2 pi cubed, so that's 2 pi to the 6. And all together then, that gives us 1 over 2 pi squared, 1 over 2 e's, for all incoming outgoing particles, 1 half sum m squared over s, s prime. We're not, we haven't yet summed over the polarizations, the polarizations of the photons. P cubed P prime, P cubed K prime. This is a four-dimensional delta function, so integrating D cubed P prime, we've gotten rid of everything except the energy part. And so this is then 1 over 2 pi squared, 1 over 2 e's, a half sum m squared, and now delta, this one is pretty simple, it's p0 prime plus k prime minus m minus k, and now we have uh, d cubed k prime, which of course is d omega k squared, k prime squared, d k prime. But now, because it's just a k prime here and not some complicated function of k squared, the dk prime cancels, and you just set k prime equal to m plus k minus p0 prime. Uh, well, p0 prime came out of that. p0 prime has been fixed also. Anyway, um, the result is that d sigma d omega then is 1 over 2 pi squared. Uh, 1 over 2 e half sum m squared and then k prime squared. All right, so so much for that. And now, um, what is this actually? And this actually was 1 half the sum over s s prime. So that's the one that we're dealing with. And this turns out then to be e to the fourth, k prime and omega prime are the same, of course. Well, Weinberg uses omega for the energy of a photon. So omega prime squared, there's a four here, and there are four twos, that gives us 64, there's a pi squared. Um, and then you wind up with an m squared and an omega squared. And if you summed up everything there, what you have is a rather beguiling formula. Okay, so that's the expression. And this was obtained, mind you, in 1929 by Klein and Nishina. And they didn't have the advantage of using Feynman's notation. They had to do it using old-fashioned perturbation theory. And in fact, they also did it before various people straightened out QED. So this is fairly impressive. Um, it's in Zytra physique. Um, OK, now the next thing to do is to average over the initial polarizations. If we do that, we get one quarter sum over T S S prime of D sigma D omega. And this now is then E to the fourth omega prime squared over 64 pi squared M squared omega squared. And now we have omega over omega prime plus omega prime over omega. Now we get minus 2 K hat dot epsilon prime squared. And let me show you why this happens. The reason is that one half sum over epsilon of this four epsilon dot epsilon prime squared is two epsilon prime i delta i j minus k i hat k j hat epsilon prime j, well, I've got a two right brackets there. Anyway, this gives us 2 minus 2 epsilon prime dot k hat squared.
squared. Remember, this is what happens when you sum the dyadic uh, epsilon, epsilon transpose. And so substituting this in there, the twos cancel, and you just get this. And what Weinberg points out is that the scattered photon then is polarized in two senses. It has to be, um, the epsilon prime has to be perpendicular to k prime, because we're in Coulomb's gauge. But this thing says that, it, that the cross-section is maximum when it's perpendicular to k hat also. So you get maximum flux of photons when epsilon prime is perpendicular to both k and k prime. If you now sum over the final ep uh, polarizations of the photons, um, uh, what you get is um, a quarter sum over everything, d sigma d omega is e to the fourth omega prime squared over 32 pi squared n squared omega squared omega over omega prime plus omega prime over omega minus one plus cosine squared theta. The, uh, it's late, so I'll just refer you to the notes if you want the details. And um, in the non relativistic limit, it turns out that you can show that omega prime is omega over 1 plus omega over m, 1 minus cosine theta. And as a result, as omega over m goes to 0, omega prime goes to omega. So these guys just become 2. And uh, this, thing, this thing approaches in the non-relativistic limit um, e to the fourth over 32 pi squared m squared 1 plus cosine squared theta, where here we've got photon in electron. This is the angle theta. This is the final uh, photon momentum, and the electron's going off like that. If you integrate over uh, cross, uh, integrate over um, cross uh, over angle of the final uh, angles, you get e to the fourth over 60, 6 pi, not 64, 6 pi m squared, which is also 8 pi over 3 r0 squared, where r0 is the classical radius of the electron, e squared over 4 pi m, or uh, alpha over m which is uh, something like 2.8 times 10 to the minus 13 centimeters or 2.8 fermions. All right, so that's, that's Compton scattering. So I, I propose we start path integrals next time. I think path integrals are Oh, and um, one student asked um, that I uh, give him a little extra time for the homework because he's, I don't know, traveling or had a hot date. I don't know what it was. Anyway, um, so if somebody else wants to turn in the homework uh, tomorrow, that's okay. Put it in the greatest box.